Hey everybody, this is Christy Matteo, the Law Talking Guy. And here I am, Steve Angstrom, back for another week. Steve, in Vegas, everybody's, everybody's got to watch everybody else. Since the players are looking to beat the casino, the dealers are watching the players, the boxmen are watching the dealers, the floor men are watching the boxmen, the pit bosses are watching the floor men, the shift bosses are watching the pit bosses, the casino manager is watching the shift bo bosses, I'm watching the casino manager, and the eye in the sky is watching us all. And since the movie Casino came out 25 years ago, we've probably watched it dozens of times. Oh, dozens, no less. So last week, Steve and I talked about important issues, health, surgery, youth sports. But today we're gonna to talk about the movie Casino, one of our favorites. For those of you who aren't aware of it, Casino is a 1995 epic crime drama directed by Martin Scorsese, starring Robert De Niro, Sharon Stone, Joe Pesci, featuring an ensemble cast, Don Rickles, Frank Vincent, James Woods. And it's a movie that, again, it's not my favorite movie, but it's one of my favorites and probably one that I'll watch more than any other movie. And this is a movie that Steve and I have both seen. Not, I don't even think we actually watched this movie together at any point. We just watched no. it and talked about it more than any other movie we've seen. Yeah, I don't even think there's another Scorsese movie that we've talked about more than Casino. Like, yeah. Goodfellas is close, but it's not, it doesn't meet Casino stature. Yeah, and, and the thing is, Casino is a great movie. And I almost think it's overshadowed by Scorsese's other movies. I mean, Raging Bull, Goodfellas, of course, The Departed. Um, I, I think, though, for whatever reason, it's a movie that we identify with and we always watch. I, I mean, there, there were at least a few times when you or I would text the other saying, hey, Casino's on AMC. And yeah, I mean... Or be like, yeah, I know, I'm already watching it. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those movies where if it's on TV, you can pick it up at any point and watch no less than 40 minutes of it straight oh, yeah. without, you know... Like, it doesn't matter where it is in the movie. You're going to sit down and watch it. Yeah. So there's a very brief summary of the plot. It's uh, 1970s. Gangsters from the Midwest. And in real life, is a Chicago outfit. In the movie, they're from Kansas City. Lend money to, uh, lend, well, the Teamsters lend money to casino operators in Las Vegas to build a casino. And the mob gets involved. Robert De Niro plays a bookmaker, Ace Rothstein, who moves out west to run the casino. Joe Pesci is a, a gangster, because that's what Joe Pesci plays. He moves out to Vegas and takes care of things. And for three hours, it's a movie about gangsters and gambling and a casino. The movie Casino oh, yeah. is about a casino. That's <laughs> all there is to it. Um, for some reason, though, there is, I mean, I think the reason why we identify with it is because unlike other gangster movies, we've actually gone to casinos and have gambled. Uh, you know, we haven't gotten involved with the Goodfellas types of gangsters, but yeah, we've all seen the things in casinos that the movie portrays and I well, like a lot of it. I mean, it's so relatable. I mean, not just, you know, everybody, everybody has that, that picture of Las Vegas in their mind and, and go and being on the Vegas Strip for the first part. I mean, it's particularly relatable to us because we grew up, you know, 40 minutes away from the biggest casinos outside of Las Vegas. But everybody has that picture in their head. And every time they turn this movie on, they're immediately standing on the Vegas Strip and in the middle of it all. Yeah. Plus, you know, with casino, there are the lights, there are the sounds. So the movie takes you, literally takes you to a casino. Um, yeah, you know, Mohe Mohegan Sun Fox was open in the mid '90s, right around when this movie came out. We were still too young to go, uh, yeah. So we didn't go to casinos until well, probably at least five or six years after. And yeah, just one of those things. I mean, you, you go to a casino and it's timeless. The movie came out in the '70s. While casinos have certainly changed in terms of technology, the basic concept's the same: uh, gambling. There's greed. And it doesn't, I, like, it doesn't matter whether it's the newest, most modern casino on the planet or if you're in some, like, off the strip, old, like, rundown casino. They all have this sort of, 
the same feel, like the same smells, the same sounds, like the carpet's always some dated pattern that you don't know whether it's 1974 or 2000 or 2020, but it, it, it just, every, there's something so unique about every, or so unique and also so the same about every casino. Oh yeah, I mean, whether you go to, again, Mohegan and Foxes in Connecticut, go to the, the Pot of Gold in Milwaukee, or uh, the river boat we went to in Missouri. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's always an experience. Um, and, and this movie, I mean, it also it was once described as Goodfellas goes west. I mean, Scorsese took his two mainstays, Pesci and De Niro, and put them out in Las Vegas where they're playing Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci characters. You know, yeah. What's there I mean, not to like about that? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a three hour movie, um, pretty entertaining three hours. No, I think, so I thought back, I first saw this, I was pretty young when I saw it. I mean, it came out in 95, I was 11 back then. I, I probably watched it maybe when I was 12 or 13. And I remember that because my dad and I watched it. We watched it on VHS. So we rented it from probably Tommy K's or one of the local yeah. stores. And when it was on VHS, it was, it was such a long movie. It was the two tapes. Yeah, it was just, this was one of the first movies I've ever seen that was on two VHS tapes. Yeah. Like, it was like this and Titanic were the two sort of mid-90s epics that were on two. I mean, that whole sentence is actually pretty dated. You, know, you had to go to a video store to rent a VHS movie. It came out, it came on two tapes. So you'd watch half the movie and then have to eject the tape and put the other one in. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that, that was part of it. Uh, no, we always watch gangster movies, so that was, I don't know, maybe I guess 11 yeah. not, 11 or 12 isn't too young to watch. <laughs> no, um, probably not. Language that although, although, although this movie, like to this day, still has two scenes in it that I cannot watch, that I fast forward through every time. And it's the head in the vice scene, and then the very end when they beat Joe Pesci and his brother to death. Like, I cannot watch those two scenes. Like, they still, like, they just don't sit right. Maybe guess, it's because I did watch it the first time when I was 12, but. Yeah, I guess, spoiler alert, everybody. Uh, Joe Pesci, a, a gangster, uh, you know, dies at the end of the movie. If you, have, if you haven't seen Casino in the past 25 years, first of all, go out and get it. And, and yeah. Also, yeah, you, you, there, there's no such thing as a spoiler on, on a movie that old. A 25 year old movie. So I guess we should just get into some of our favorite moments from the movie. Um, actually, we probably should start off with so this is actually based on a true story. Um, not just casinos, but on a very particular true story. So, as I said before, um, the mob, you know, the, the mafia, would arrange for the Teamsters to loan money to casino investors to buy or open a casino. And, but the mob, of course, wants something in return. So what they got was the skim. And the skim is the, as close as there is a plot to Casino, even Scorsese himself said it's three hours with no plot. Uh, the skim is the focus. It's how the mob got money off the top of the casino. So Stephen, how does, how does the movie show how the skim works? Yeah, I, I think this is one of the things that Scorsese suddenly does very well in, in both Casino and Goodfellas. And he sort of, because the mafia is sort of this mystical thing to people. And it, it's often, you, you always think of the mafia as an illegal money-making venture, but you, you don't really know how they do it. And this and Goodfellas, and Goodfellas do a really good job of sort of subtly explaining to it. And they start right at the very beginning when he says the only way you could buy a casino in Las Vegas is to get a Teamsters loan. And obviously, you know, everybody knows from Jimmy Hoffa that the, the mob ran, ran the Teamsters. So they gave the money to the casino, to the, to, um, the, uh, uh, Philip, the Philip Green character in this movie to buy the casino. And then basically, you know, they, they simplified the skim a whole lot, but Really, all it was is this guy would walk into the room where they were counting the money and just empty out a you know a couple stacks of uh, of bills, put them in his briefcase, and walk out. And it's it's obviously more complicated than that, but that's how they talked about it in the movie. Yeah, I mean, a skim refers to any money off the top of of a business. So you take money off the top and you pocket it. It doesn't get reported as income, so you don't pay tax on it. So the mob was actually probably getting its loan paid back 
with interest and they were getting this extra cash. Yeah. Um, yeah, the way the mob, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, the Teamsters con- had a pension fund. So if you remember the Teamsters and you were a driver or other Teamster member, you, you know, you, your, your employer paid into a pension fund and that was invested. So the Teamsters had, you know, in, back then, in the billions in their pension fund to invest. Um, and there's this possible actually in a few gangster movies. Uh, well, actually, the Irishman deals with, with that too. But that, that was it. In, in real life, though, so I read this a couple of weeks ago. I sent you the article on how the real skim worked. And mm-hmm. it was a little more complex than that. And actually, I thought this was fascinating. But yeah, a little, a little bit a little too much for the movie. What they did in real life, they would weigh the coins. That's how they would know how much money. And they were only skimming off the slots. That's how they would know how heavy, how much money was made in the slot machines. They'd weigh it. So the, the operators of the Stardust, which is what this is based on, would, would, would tip the scales. So the scales would actually weigh a lighter amount. So they'd put in uh, you know, $1,000 worth of nickels. And it was, it was really, the scale would weigh $1,000 worth of nickels, but there's really $1,100 worth of nickels. So yeah. they would then package the thousand, take it to the bank. But they had this other money that they needed to get out. And they had, and you have to, they had to launder it, but they were self-laundering it. They couldn't, they couldn't just grab it and start using it. So they would then bring the money back up to the floor. And again, this was before cards. Now, yeah, you, put, you put a card in the machine, you, you spin it. Back then it was all change. So players would, Break, they use dollar bills to get change and they feed the, the change in the machines. So the casino would have women who were you know, uh, change girls walk around and change bills for people. And they would then put the bills in, in a box and exchange the coins out of the box. And then the mob would send somebody who would empty out the cash out of those boxes. Mm-hmm. So that was the actual skim, which I, you know, could have been a fascinating movie in itself, but all this stuff yeah. going on at the casino. That's not surprising they didn't focus on that. But yeah, that's yeah. how the skim worked. Um, now, we're both Italian-American. Um, we don't have any connections to organized crime. Not because, not just because crime's bad, but if you know my family, we're anything but organized. So, <laughs> yeah, we, we, I mean, my, my family has lost a lot of money at casinos, but we, we were not involved in any kind of racketeering involving casinos. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, so best moments. Um, well, what's your favorite moment of, of the movie? I, I think either the, the first 10 minutes of the movie where they, ex- where they explain the skim or the quote that you opened the podcast with where, they're, where they talk about the eye in the sky. There are just the two most memorable parts, like from the minute that Ace Rothstein gets in that car and it explodes at the beginning of the movie – walking all the way through the skim and the, the, how they buy the casino. That's probably my favorite part, it's probably the opening scene. Yeah, I, th- I think it was great. And I in the sky quote's great. And the reason why that's great is because that's true. I mean, how many times, whenever we go to a casino, that's probably the first thing I think of when I walk in. It's, I start oh, yeah. looking around and, yep, everybody's watching everybody and they're all watching mm-hmm. us. And my favorite scene, it's hard to say, because there's so many, like, casino's a great movie because it's a collection of great scenes. I mean, it has oh, yeah. a story, but it's a loose story. The story itself is really a vehicle to just put these scenes and these great actors together. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think this, it's one of those movies that I bet probably every time I watch it, I have a different favorite scene. But I'll say yeah. one of my favorite scenes that I, I've always liked and I, I've liked more recently is the balloon head scene. And that's when... So Joe Pesci plays yeah. Nicky Santoro, mob enforcer, also known as a hitman or just a, just a no, muscle. And he's explaining. So this movie has a lot of voiceover. Every character, I think, has a voiceover moment, at least one, and, and some have longer ones than others. So this is when Nicky talks about how he first arrived in Vegas. And he's, again, back then, the mob was involved in casinos. And some gangsters or mobs would try to take casinos for their own, the same way mobs would demand protection money from local businesses, and they'd shake people down. So Nikki arrived in Las Vegas to keep Ace and the casino safe for his crew, the the Kansas City gangsters. 
and at one point he said he talks about these two balloon heads that came in trying to rob the casino and he just has this discussion with them when um, he approaches them and they know who he is he knows who they are but their conversation is is all about um oh you're over here now yeah i'm over here now you're here yeah, yeah i'm with him oh we're waiting for carmine <laughs> oh i just saw him oh he was here yeah i mean it's it's just so it's funny because they all know it's the one it's one of the few scenes in the movie where the characters inherently know exactly what's going on, but the viewer has really right. no idea. Like all you know is somehow these two guys are trying to steal money from them and Nikki's stopping it. Like so yeah, I mean it's a scene that could really be dissected. So I, I, it took me a while to figure it out, but from what I read and from when rewatching it, so they're at a credit window. So it, it seems that it's probably just a simple matter of they're taking out a marker and they just weren't going to pay it back. Yeah. I mean, that's probably all there was to it. It wasn't an armed robbery. And then when they saw Nikki there, and the thing is, when I watched it again, they all know one another. Nikki knows their names. They know his name. Mm-hmm. So that's why, one, I mean, on one hand, like, shouldn't those guys have known going, going in this is Nikki's casino? But for whatever reason, they didn't, and they knew then. But right, yeah. it's um, they all know what's going on. Those guys know they're busted. He knows what they're doing, and they kind of play nice. And again, because yeah. uh, they're guys in another crew, and they didn't accomplish anything. You know, Nikki lets them off with a warning instead yeah. of doing other things that Nikki does. Well, I think that's the purpose of the scene, right? Is it sets up the next scene. Which is, you know, at the very end, you have the overview, the uh, the voiceover of Rothstein saying, you know, out of respect, guys from other crews got off with a warning, and then they go into the guys who are who are cheating the blackjack game uh, with the oh, yeah. cattle prod. So, you know, I mean, I think that's that's like the, that's why they do that scene because it sort of sets up that more violent next scene where they, you know, break the guy's hand and hit him with a cattle prod and <laughs> another great scene in the movie. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just one of those things that there is something in mob movies, at least with the way Scorsese does them, that there is a code. Mm-hmm. That these guys are criminals. They do terrible things, including murder. But there's still some sort of decency they have with one another, that there's a right way of doing things and a wrong way of doing things. And when you do things the wrong way, that's when things get ugly and that's when... You, know, you get stabbed in the neck or you get your head in a vice or <laughs> yeah but yeah i'd say those are some of the favorite scenes i mean another one of my favorite scenes because it, re- it reveals a lot about and scorsese does a great job revealing his characters through the small scenes and the scene with ace rothstein and kevin pollack i know plays phil green when they're eating breakfast mm-hmm. and ace notices that his blueberry muffin doesn't have many blueberries in it and Kevin Pollock's muffin has a ton of blueberries in it and that's just a great scene because it has Ace noticing the small detail it then has in a again a very minor role but a big performance Kevin Pollock doing the what are you talking about yeah and they go into the kitchen and Ace makes the chef put an equal number of blueberries in his muffins yeah and that's a great scene where the chef is just standing there holding the blueberry and he goes you want me to put an equal number of blueberries into each muffin? You know how long that will take? And he's like, I don't care. I, want, I mean, it's just like, it's just so good. Like the chef standing there in complete, just completely baffled that he now has to put an equal number of blueberries into each muffin. Yeah. Uh, I mean, some of the other great scenes, uh, the one when uh, Ace fires Ward, the dumb guy mm-hmm. that's running the slot machine. Oh, yeah. Then, that's another one that, yeah, that's, that, that, that's, that's true. When three s- slot machines go off in close succession and he says, all right, you either should have known you were being set up or, or you're in on it. You're either too dumb yeah. or you're part of it. And when the guy says, well, you know, people have to win in a while. No, they don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, in casinos. Casino always wins. Well, unless yeah. you somehow ran casinos in Atlantic City and went bankrupt. You know, that, that happens to some people, but... Yeah, not not many, but 
<laughs> one or so. One guy we could think of, you know, Fredo. One guy. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, it's just it, the, the tr- like for a movie that really has no plot, it's just a collection of one after another all star scene or all star quote. I mean, just when like the inter, it's almost, I think one of my favorite parts is when they do the voiceovers. It's almost like there is either somebody interviewing all of these people or they're talking to each other the way they interplay because where we're Nikki's talking about how they're making the money and he's like, yeah, we had a foolproof scheme. And then it immediately cuts to eighth Ross team where he goes, yeah, they had a foolproof scheme. All right. When he won, they collected. When he didn't, he told the bookies yeah. to go fuck themselves. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nick, Nick, Nikki's gambling methods weren't scientific, but they worked. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, so, so there's some great scenes in terms of performances. And this is just an all-star cast. I mean, De Niro and Pesci yeah. are great. They're basically playing their, their they're Goodfellas characters, but no one yeah. else can do that. Sharon Stone was phenomenal. Yeah. And then I read a note today, I was looking at the trivia, that Michelle Pfeiffer was actually offered this role first. And the thing yeah, is, crazy. I like Michelle Pfeiffer, I can't imagine anybody other than Sharon Stone playing Ginger. No, I, I, I can't. Michelle Pfeiffer, like, she wouldn't, like, the degenerate alcoholic drug addict, she's not as, I mean... Sharon Stone is, is just better at, at making you believe that she has all of those, like all of those facets, like the super charming, like can get whatever she wants, casino hustler, and at the same time be this just completely spiraling into oblivion drug addict. Like I, I didn't, yeah. I don't know that Michelle Pfeiffer would be as believable. Yeah, I think you also need Sharon Stone because this movie is, it's Vegas and you need that right. showy quality. And not that Michelle she, Pfeiffer doesn't, I mean, she's a, incredible actress gorgeous but Sharon Stone I mean just like as soon as like I mean talk about how the actress lights up the screen I mean, mm-hmm. her first appearance when she's throwing the chips at the table yeah and you watch that I was like wow this, this is a good character I, I, she's, yeah she's gonna win this movie and, and you know and then even the the minor character I mean you have Don Rickles playing Billy the oh. what, what's Billy's job is he the casino manager Casino manager, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, Frank Vincent plays Joe Pesci's top guy. Frank Vincent, just one of those great gangster movie or gangster TV that guys. He's in all. Yeah. He was in The Sopranos. He was in Raging Bull. He was in Goodfellas. He plays always Billy supporting. Jackson. Yeah. Um. They have. Uh, Again, James Woods plays Lester Diamond. All-star performance by James Woods. I mean, of all of the good performances in this movie, James Woods might be my favorite, favorite performance of the movie. Just yeah, as the... A, there's a lot of the limited role. I mean, Lester Diamond plays uh, Ginger's ex-boyfriend, pimp. Just this absolute scumbag. And James Woods knocks it out of the park. I mean, it's perfect from the mustache to the, the, the webbed see-through shirt that he wears underneath the blazer. Like it's just, it's perfect. Yeah. And here's the thing. I mean, there are all these, there's some really graphic scenes in this movie, almost all of them involving Nikki played by Joe Pesci, whether it's putting someone's head in a vice or stabbing someone with a pen. You know, James Woods' character I, I kind of wanted to see Lester get a little more. I know they rough him up a few times, but I was like, yeah, yeah. yeah. come on, Nikki. What you... um, he's just always coming in hot every time he's on, this, on the screen. Like, it's just perfect. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, this movie is a lot of profanity, a lot of violence. I mean, it's not, it's, it's pretty graphic, not as much as other movies. No, it's not like a Tarantino movie, but it's up there. Um, hey, so you mentioned your most uncomfortable scenes. So when Joe yeah. Pesci puts uh, someone's head in a vice, and then when he and his brother get beaten to death. Yeah, I'd say my, I'd say probably the least comfortable scene is when Ginger comes back to the house. After oh, yeah. She, like, blew all the money, and she and Ace have a legitimate fight like a physical domestic violence altercation yeah the dragging the screaming that was a rough yeah scene. rough 
And I think it is because for me, like that's, that is something that I know happens to people. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Gangsters. I want to say you have it coming to you when you get your head put in a vice, but it, it, domestic violence is a, and that, that's a very believable and, and also just rough scene. When, when yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, so just as it epitomizes that relationship, the one built yeah. on just excess and mistrust. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> the head in the vice. And that's actually, if I'm mistaken, I think once they put the guy's head in the vice, I think they cut his throat. I mean, that's, yeah, that's yeah. how they. Yeah, that's how they finish him off. Yeah, <laughs> it's just bad, like crazy. Um, Best quotes. I mean, the I in the sky quote's really good. It's hard to top that. And yeah. The the quote about how Nikki's you know, gambling methods weren't scientific, but they worked. Yeah. That's one of my favorites. Um, God, I mean, there's just, it, it's just, there's so many of them that they all tend to kind of fall in with each other. Um this, like just and and the thing about all the quotes from this movie is most of the best quotes come from the the voiceover. They don't even necessarily come from the characters themselves. Like just the descriptions. Like I loved when uh, when when they're talking when Nikki finally gets put in the black book and they're talking about all of the um, all of his like his crew and his his uh, his jewelry store and he turns his bedroom into a vault and he's like. I was the only one who had the key. Jennifer fell asleep on the couch every night. She didn't care. Like, like just the little side things that he puts in, or when he's co- coaching his kids' baseball team, and the other coach is one of the uh, the Vegas cops, and he's like, "It's all for the kids, though, you know." Yeah. Like, so, so this is actually a funny movie in terms of the relationship with the cops because you have that scene, then you have the scene when Ace is very civilly talking to the police officers as they're escorting Ginger in and out of the house. Yeah. Then the other side, you have Dominic working at, at at Nikki's restaurant, spitting in the sandwich, which looks like a great sandwich, by the way. Oh yeah. I, I don't know what that is. So that's some pastrami, or not pastrami, maybe some cabagool, some um, prosciutto. I mean, and then uh, then you also the other scene where Nikki and his crew get coked up and legitimately stand outside the cop's house and, and, and shoot it. That's one of the most unintentionally funny scenes in the movie because it's horrible. Like they're literally firing automatic weapons into the house of a law enforcement officer. And but like you just you you cannot help but laugh at it for some reason. Like it's it should not be funny, but it's just because of how brazen they are. I yeah, mean, this isn't a drive by. They're standing out in his front yard with these comical, coked out looks on their faces with yeah, like machine guns and rifles, just shooting at it. It's r- ridiculous. Like that, that, and the other unintentional comedy is when the cops kill the gangster who had a who had a hero sandwich in his yeah. hand because they thought it was a gun, and they're like looking at the body, and he's like, "It's a it's a hero sandwich. You're gonna get us in so much trouble." Like, how much paperwork do I have to do? Yeah, yeah. How about that? I mean, this has nothing to do with the, uh, the movie, but yeah, they call it a hero sandwich. A good that's the, the Midwestern term for yeah. Now in Connecticut, we'd call it a grinder, grinder or sub. In Philadelphia, it's a hoagie. Kansas City and that area, it's a it's a hero. But yeah, I remember that scene. Um. Yeah, so those are some of the best quotes. I, one category I had best best murder. What's your favorite? To to the extent a murder can be your favorite on screen. Who's your favorite? I think my favorite, because it also has a really good quote assigned to it, is when um, Philip Green's like business associate shows up and she tries to take him to court and sue him. And they're like, well, before they could do that, the boss has decided to settle the case out of court. And she's literally just drinking a cup of coffee at her kitchen table. And Nikki, for some reason, is able to just waltz into her house and murder her while she's sitting there eating. It's just, yeah. it, it's the, the whole, like, the whole um, scene is just so good. Yeah, it also just shows Nikki. I mean, he's this, yeah, likable sociopath who walks in with a gun with a silencer on it. Mm-hmm. Um, just, yeah, my favorite, my favorite whacking 
it's probably one of the ones at the end. The guy in Costa Rica. Oh yeah, Nance. He, he was the skim guy. Yeah, he was good. And also because the two guys who do it, those characters have almost no speaking roles in the movie, but they're the ones that are taking care of all the business at the end. The two yeah. hitmen. I'm sure they yeah. have names, but I don't think anyone refers to them by name. No. So I think you're supposed to think those are some of the big time. Those are the, the, the Chicago guys, the ones who are yeah, who are taking care of the problems. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's so many, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of on-screen murders in the movie. Uh, I think one of my favorite parts about the whole murder montage at the end is that the decision to make to kill all of those people happened when the guys were in the back of the courtroom and like half of them are sucking off oxygen tanks. And that's, that's literally how they just where and how they decided to murder 12 people. And this is the one that they're not, they're not thinking about killing, but I think it's Remo who says, eh, hey, uh, do you really want oh, to take that chance? It's Andy Stone, the, right. the, the, uh, the head, you know, the, the guy who basically ran the whole thing. Yeah. Now, again, in real life, so there, there was this whole skim going on, and the way it got busted in the movie and in real life was just they asked for all this, for all the care they took in this operation, they were just talking about it on a, on a, bu- on a wiretap. The, the, the local police in Kansas City were trying, were investigating a murder, and they heard the, the gangsters. Um, talking about the skim in the store that where the bug was and that was that you know, led yeah. to the FBI investigating it and, and bringing it down in terms of MVP of the movie this is a tough one because there's so many great performances oh who, yeah who, who do you think really had the best performance or maybe the best performance other than De Niro and Pesci I think that's how we yeah, you got, you got to do that. I mean, De Niro and Pesci are just so all star. Um, I don't as much as I don't like her character because she's just such a dislikable. I mean, it just speaks to how well she played it. It's got to be Sharon Stone. I, yeah, I mean, I, I think so. It, her character is just so detestable and so likable in other ways at the same time. Like, yeah. Well, I mean, what's your favorite Sharon Stone moment? Your favorite ginger scene because there are a lot of them this, this might be harder than your favorite murder because she has so yeah. many great scenes yeah i think it's probably it's it's got to be where she throws the chips into the air when when like the guy accuses her of stealing and she just completely throws it like the first time you meet her in the movie that's a good one i, I would say after that my favorite is probably because what Sharon Stone does really well in this, not only are those big scenes, but the small scenes. Mm-hmm. Just these little brief moments of hers. Like there's the, right, I think it's right before the Charlie the Banker scene. Mm-hmm. And, you know, background, Joe Pesci legitimately tries to invest his money, but he's not happy that his portfolio is going down. So he demands to meet Charlie the Banker. And shortly before that, this is in the morning, uh, Ginger is making a drink while already drunk wearing a tennis skirt <laughs> oh at yeah 11 o'clock in the morning yeah and uh there yeah, says to push her down the stairs i mean not throw her down the stairs but yeah that, that's just a great ginger moment i mean yeah i say all the scenes with her with her are great even um the scene when she's talking when she, yeah, well, the, as much as they didn't like it the affair she had with Nikki, but that yeah. happened in real life. So mm-hmm. they put that in. Well, but when she's trying, actually, so here's the thing. When, she's, when she asks Nikki to whack Ace, and Ace says, I've known the guy for 30 years. Do you want me to whack him over you? <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's, I mean, just, it's just the whole movie is just little retorts and, and comments like that that just make it so perfect. Um, a great scene, again, it's not as much a Sharon Stone scene as it is, I guess, a James Wood scene. When they kidnap the daughter and they're, they get Ace on the phone. And I don't, actually, I don't know who the, the actress who plays the daughter is. Does she ever amount to anything after that? She might have just stopped acting as a kid. But when she's 
harassing James Woods when she's uh, sticking her tongue out at him. <laughs> that whole scene is great. So that was actually, I was reading it today, that was actually Sharon Stone's idea. She decided that like the little girl should annoy James Woods the entire time they're on camera together. So that was a Sharon Stone thing. Yeah, that's good, good on her part. Actually, in that, in that scene when, um, when James Woods says, oh, you know, he's just sitting there like a dumbbell. And then she immediately responds, wait, he called you here. He yeah. You're here. He's yeah. sending guys over right now. <laughs> yeah. And sure enough. Yeah. Was yeah they were. Yeah. James Woods getting roughed up is, is part of this, is two of the better scenes in the movie. Yeah, I think so. And then we have, oh, you're a guy that likes colorful jackets. Ace oh, Rothstein yeah. gives your closet a run for, for its money. What's your favorite Ace Rothstein jacket? He comes out so hot with the pink jacket right at the beginning as he's getting into the car, into the car. It's got to be either that one or the lime green. Hmm. Like those are those top two for me. Lime green's a good one. I'll have to go with, so he has a nice plaid jacket that he wears at the, the early in the movie when he's, when he's sitting at the pool. Yeah. It's that one. But I probably have to go with, the yellow one he wears when they're at the, in the bank vault opening the state yeah. deposit box. That, that's my favorite. Yeah. I'm more of a yellow than a red person. Yeah. So it actually, so De Niro had 70 different costumes throughout the film and Sharon Stone had 40 and both were allowed to keep them afterward, which is a fun fact. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the thing is, when he, and then, and yeah, back to that scene when he's at the pool, early on we're like oh they'll never license me and then the other guy says you don't need a license you just have to apply for a license yeah this is really it's, fu it's funny because that really happened like right. that's exactly how they did it was they just kept switching his title so they would move his application to the bottom of the pile what one of the hidden uh little hidden things in the movie is actually at the scene where they're sitting at the pool and, and they're talking about it so you know the the real um casino was based off of the stardust but it was and it was filmed at the riviera but it was called the tangiers when they're at the pool together andy stone character is actually wearing a bathrobe from the riviera hmm. so they threw that in there kind of a homage to the the hotel they were filming at yeah yeah again one of those movies that the more i guess like any movie but the more you see it the more things you pick up on oh yeah hey well what other things do we have and we have sure. um We've done best murder. Well, I guess most ridiculous mm -hmm. scene. I mean, I still think the most ridiculous scene is when they're shooting up <laughs> the cops. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's got to be. See, best minor character. And there's so many minor characters. And I, I'd look this actor up. But the, the county commissioner, the two oh, yeah. scenes he's in, LQ Jones, I think is his name. And he has an IMDb page with, I think 140 acting credits. He was always oh, wow. a sheriff or yeah, <laughs> that guy in a western. And that's oh yeah, is the county commissioner. I also like the state. Down. I also like the state senator right. who he, who, they, who they put up and then later on in the movie denies him the gaming license. Hmm. You know, I think so. In real life, former U.S. Senator Harry Reid of Nevada. Hmm was one of the gaming people in the real life version of the Oh, movie. really? I don't know. I mean, I haven't heard anything about him with you know, the, the bribes and things like that. But yeah, Harry Reid was involved in, in that when he was in, uh, a Nevada state level politician. So another fun fact. So in the, uh, the trivia for this movie, I'm reading right now. So apparently, Pesci's wife at the time of filming was, was a woman named Claudia Haro. She played the co-hostess and band leader of Ace Rothstein's variety show, Ace's Ace is High. High. But she was apparently convicted in 2000 of two counts of attempted murder for hiring a hitman to try to kill her other ex-husband, who was a stuntman. That's yeah, out I mean, of nowhere. I guess, I guess you just get in on that uh, casino lifestyle. and you... yeah. yeah. Crazy. I mean... 
Again, Ace Rothstein hosting the TV show inside the casino, which again, he did in real life. Ace Rothstein was based on Lefty Rosen, Rosenthal. Yeah. He was a Chicago, well, again, he, he wasn't really a gangster. He was a, a gambler that was associated with the mob. Mm -hmm. The Nicky Santoro is based on um, Anthony Spilatro, who was, a, who was a, a pretty famous yeah. Chicago gangster. Again, I think we both watched, again, at different times, the real story of Casino on either Nat Geo or A&E, one of yeah. those channels. And one of those, like, I just put it on. And yeah, I watched that whole documentary for two hours because I mean, the, the oh, real yeah. life story is as interesting as the movie with these characters. Absolutely. So this is what's interesting about this movie. It's a gangster movie that takes place in Vegas, but it's... Joe Pesci and Robert De Niro basically playing their Goodfellas characters. So they're basically New York gangsters, Scorsese gangsters mm -hmm. in Vegas. But in real life, yeah. this is actually the Chicago mob. The Chicago yeah. Act is what it's called. And then their subsidiaries from Milwaukee, Kansas City. I think at Cleveland was part of that. In the movie, it was Kansas City, but I think in real life, it's Cleveland and Milwaukee. So here's the thing. Chicago is a city of well-known for it's mob and corruption. There hasn't been all that, there really haven't been any great Chicago gangster movies. I mean, the only ones I could think of, not including this, I mean, you have The Untouchables, which is a Capone. Yeah. That's all right. Kind of a self parody, but you know, it's entertaining. And you have Road to Perdition, but that's not really a gangster movie. That's more of a father son mm -hmm. bonding movie. That's a road movie. There's, um, well, Public Enemies isn't really Chicago either. That's just Midwest. So yeah, I just don't, I just don't get it. Why, again, there are great movies about, as Scorsese's done gangsters in Boston. He's done them in New York. Did this one in Vegas. And Coppola's yeah. movies are, well, Godfather was all in New York. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just feel like we're past due for a good Chicago gangster movie. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think it's, you know, when you think of the mafia, you think of New York and Vegas, like to the late, to the average person is, you know, everybody sort of knows that Chicago has that mafia tradition, but it's just not as, uh, it's not as, as popularized. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not yeah. what people think. I think a big part of it is that most people's uh, perception of the mob is actually filtered through the Godfather through Mario yeah. Puzo's versions. So everybody thinks of, you know, the Capos and the Five Families yeah. and all that. I mean, Al Capone is probably the most famous gangster in history. He's, He's in Chicago. Chicago. Yeah. Yep. I, mean, I guess, well, Boardwalk Empire, that's Atlantic City. I mean, Al Capone was a character in it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's why I mean, I think, um, from what I even heard, a lot of the mob traditions that you see actually derive, were made up by Mario Puzo. And then when yeah. The Godfather was made, real gangsters tried acting like the Don and, and the yeah. Corleone family. Mm -hmm. Whereas in real life, it really you know, it's more like you know, kind of low yeah. life, low level thugs, the way Goodfellas yeah. portrays. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I'd say, I mean, Don Rickles' performance as Billy is one of my favorites. Oh, yeah. Because here's the thing, because, you know, Nikki is supposed to be Ace's boyhood friend. But, yeah, they, they have their problems. Whereas Billy, Billy's his real confidant. I mean, at the, yeah. at, when, um, when Ace says to Billy, hey, you know, come over, you know, bring the gun. Billy shows up with a break action shotgun. He's ready to do some business. I mean, I feel like... Yeah. If, if I were ever in that situation, I called you, hey, Steve, can you, can you, can you come over? With the, you, you'd show up with, <laughs> with something. Yeah, yeah. You'd find something. I'm not saying you have Yeah, I mean, would, but, you know. no, yeah, that's, actually, yeah, that's. I was actually surprised. I mean, I, the break action shotgun fits Billy's character pretty well. Although, he could. I think a snub nosed revolver would also fit his character really well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, for some reason, you expect him to show up with a break action shotgun. Like, you don't know why, but it's perfect. Yeah, so here's a, here's a question. Why does Ace Rothstein 
the big time casino boss who has mob ties, why doesn't he have his own gun? Could it be because he has a felony record and he wants to follow the law? But if you want to be a law abiding citizen, you're hanging out with Nikki Santoro who's putting guys' heads in vices. I think that was, that's sort of the big, um, you know, Ace Rothstein is sort of the Michael Corleone of this movie where he's so intertwined with this world, but all he wants to do is see himself as like a legitimate businessman and he can just never separate himself away from the, the mob, like the mafia entity that follows him, you know, the, 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 uh, the Nicky Santoro or the, you know, for, you know, is to Ace Rothstein what, you know, Sonny Corleone and, and the rest of the family was for Michael. Yeah, maybe that's it. You know, he doesn't want to, you know, maybe Ace Rothstein thinks that, you know, having a gun makes you just another, another thug. You know, he's too, he doesn't want to get his hands dirty with that. And that also leads to that great scene, which I think it's, I think it's the Charlie the Banker scene, shortly after that, when Ace says, you know, you've lost control. And then Nikki says, I've lost control. You're wearing a bathrobe and using a cigarette holder. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, like, uh, like, like, um, yeah, John Barrymore. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it's just, it's the perfect, like, gaudy excess that the mob came to, to represent. Like, the scene in Goodfellas when she's like, they didn't look good. They wore a lot of double knits and they looked beat up. Like, <laughs> God. <laughs> Oh, you know, I don't know how I missed this, but great scene when Ace is meeting with the the gaming board in, in his backyard. Nikki's playing golf with his buddies, and then the FBI plane lands on the golf course. So they run out of fuel. It's so good. I mean, they just circle and circle. And I mean, that's. And then they, I, I would say the plane landing. And the shooting up the house. Those are probably the two most ridiculous scenes in the movie. Yeah. And yet they're believable. Probably. Like you, yeah. you, you don't have to suspend your disbelief. You know what? I could kind of see that happening. I mean, yeah. In the universe, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, what's funny is like, Nikki was just so in love with crime because at one point, like we were talking about, they, they just, they allude to the fact that he was always very successful in the restaurant business. Like he probably could have been a multimillionaire in the restaurant business, but he just loved stealing people and murdering people that he couldn't ever give it up. Yeah, well, I, I said that, it, 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 it seems that Nikki, in addition to being a know, successful gangster, was successful at business. He had his restaurant and he also had the, the jewelry store. But you pointed yeah. out, uh, you know, it's easy to make money at a jewelry store when you're stealing your inventory. Yeah. Yeah, gold rush. But in real life, Tony Spilatro was given the casino gift shop to run. Yeah, and I think he ran successfully. They weren't just stealing things. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to know more about the restaurant with the the milk fed veal. <laughs> that's that's I that's up there with one of the most like you know, unintended. I mean, it probably was intentionally funny though when the two showgirls are in there and the Frank Vincent character introduces uh, Nikki to them. And says, oh, you want to go sit there? He goes, yeah, we're going to go check out the kitchen first. And then they just literally walk right through the kitchen out to Nikki's car, although that was understood that that was how the scene was going to end between both of them. And he's talking about the milk-fed veal. Yeah. Yeah, that's a classic scene. Again, great Frank Vincent moment. Oh, yeah. And the other thing is that toward the end of the movie, you know, Frank Vincent is the one that kills Nikki. So the the one mm-hmm. to the extent somebody comes out a winner in all this, it's it's his character. Yeah, it was uh well, it's ironic that he played Billy Bats in in Goodfellas, and then he gets uh he gets revenge in in Casino. And I think I saw somewhere that he that Joe Pesci beat him up in Raging Bull. So yeah, I, mean, I don't know how the two of those guys were off screen, but on screen they certainly had their issues. Yeah, just a classic all around movie. Um, you know, parallels to real life. I, I never had. I, I, casino doesn't have to try to rip me off. I just, I just lose. Uh, I, I expect to lose going into. Yeah, that. I mean, so I look at it. I go to a casino with a certain amount of money. I'm willing to spend. The way I see it, if you go to a concert, you spend money. If you go to a movie, you spend money. 
go to a casino. You're, 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 you're receiving some entertainment. I don't go to a casino trying to make money. That's not my, oh uh, yeah, I need to stretch this paycheck or anything like that. No, I go for entertainment. And one, one thing I learned over the years, don't just set a limit to how much you'll lose. Set a limit to how much you'll win. Because yeah. the times that I've been the most annoyed at a casino weren't when I lost the money I came in with. It's when I won money and then kept playing and lost the money I made. Yeah. And I walk out saying, you know, I had those guys beat. I was playing with house money and then I lost it. I did what they wanted me to do. All well, just like the play. scene. Yeah, just like the scene where they, uh, the, uh, the businessman comes in and wins $2 million oh, right. and then steals, steals all the bath towels upstairs, but then they, uh, they fake a mechanical error in his plane to get him back, and he ends up dropping a million of his own money. So one of the things they don't mention in the movie, or at least they don't do it directly, is that I think we're supposed to think that Ginger was doing stuff like that. Like she would shake guys down and get them to spend money yeah. on her, but also at the casino. Yeah. And yeah, I think that was what they alluded to sort of at the beginning of her character where she gives, like she tips the, um, she tips the valets who then give her like the drugs that she can give to the guy who like the amphetamine so he stays up all night. Yeah. Now I haven't seen it yet, but there's that movie that came out, ah, it came out maybe last year, the one with uh, J-Lo and Cardi B where they're the strippers. Oh, hustlers. Yeah. So I've heard it's good. I haven't seen it, but I haven't either. It looks yeah, some of that I'd say. Yeah, I think I, and that's a real scam that they were running in New York where they were it's got it's got eighty seven percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Yeah, Vegas hustling. And then uh, like, like everything, um nothing lasts forever, so eventually the, the Tangiers was knocked down, all the characters mm -hmm. on. Ginger tragically dies of an overdose as her real life inspiration. Uh, I think Jerry McGee was her name did. Um, Nikki, being a violent gangster, dies a violent death. Same yeah. Way, uh, Tommy. No, I mean, not Tommy. That's the thing. I, I mixed up his name already because Tommy was the character in Goodfellas. Who yeah. Dies a violent death. <laughs> um, but yeah, his real life inspiration, Anthony Scalatro, of course, was murdered. Um, mm. Yeah, not, not a kind of life you really want to get into. At least I wouldn't. I, I, I'd be up for the casino business, but hey, you know, not, not the mob. I, yeah, I, I wouldn't be up for the mob. Um, the, so I think one of the sort of questions that's hard to answer about this movie, then they, they, you know, it's intentional, but who tried to kill Ace? Was it Nikki? Was it Ginger? Um, he says in the movie that he thinks he knew who did it, but um, what do you? Th I mean, what do you think? You know, for some reason, I just don't think it was Nikki. First, I don't think bombing was Nikki's thing. Nikki yeah. is all about the personal murders, shooting yeah. somebody in the head with a with a gun, with a silencer, cutting someone's throat, that sort of stuff. I, I also think that. I don't have any basis for this, but, and again, you're in, in the mob, you're supposed to be loyal to the mob, not to your friends. Look at you know, Frank mm -hmm. Vincent's character killed. Susan. Yeah. That's happened in a lot of movies, actually, not, not just that one. Right. But I, I would think that given Ace's history with Nikki, Nikki would probably, if he wanted to kill him, would do it face to face or yeah, he wouldn't blow up his car. Um, I mean, could Ginger have hired somebody? Yeah, possibly. My my guess would be it was probably it was probably another gang. Just because I, I think Ace was worth too much to the guys back home. Because even at the end of the yeah. movie, he doesn't get killed the way everybody else does. They kept him alive because he was still making right. money for them. Right. Um, again, I think in real yeah. life there was a. Like it was still, it was unknown who actually bombed Lefty's car, but yeah. they said it was there. There was this guy who's known as the bomber, 
mm. that I think was hired to blow people up. But what's your theory on it? So he he sort of alludes in the movie that he thinks it's Nikki because um, he says like I like they never figured out who planted the bomb, but I think I know who did it. Like he thinks it's Nikki, but it, it, like I I kind of agree. It's hard to hard to believe that, but it obviously wasn't the bosses because at the end of the movie, like you said, they keep him alive. So um, it, hard to say. But I, I just I love it's another great scene in the movie when he talks about how what no one outside of the factory knew oh, yeah. was that that particular plate. car had a had a steel plate underneath the driver's side. Yeah, and yeah. I think they. And they what I read, they stuck that there to balance the car. Like it didn't have any yeah. other purpose than that. Yeah, the Cadillac no. Eldorado. Um, yeah. The other thing is, I guess the other theory is maybe it was never intended to be a murder. It was just supposed to send him a message that they yeah. get too hot here. Um, yeah and it's in the movie well first of all it really happened so it's easy to put that in a movie but also just a show you know, you're living that life your card might blow up at some point yeah exactly um yeah so that's so in in sort of the the synopsis of the movie is they the they allude to the fact that nikki was actually killed because he tried to kill sam rothstein but I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think they, they definitely don't sp- explicitly tell you that in the movie. Yeah, I, I always thought the reason they killed Nicky was just because he was going nuts and he was becoming a liability. Yeah. He was killing everybody. Yeah. He was, again, I mean, as funny as we find the scene, and again, we do not condone violence against police officers or shooting anybody, don't condone any kind of violence. We just are noting that it's incredibly ridiculous to openly fire guns at anybody's house. It, just out in the open. But if you're, yeah. no, again, if you're the, the boss in Chicago or Kansas City, um, yeah, you don't want your guy out in Las Vegas shooting at a cop's house. No. So, yeah, he's going to piss off some people. So that, yeah, that's... Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that, that's my... That's, again, you, when, you, when you're in the business of stealing and killing, yeah, you're going to rub some people the wrong way. So it's only a matter of time until you're expendable. Right. Your bosses don't want you or somebody else does it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Overall, just classic from beginning to end. Yeah, I think so. Um, and the thing is, not only is it a, if it's great from beginning to end, but because it's a collection of great scenes and great lines... Again, you can watch any part of it any time. Right. You don't. You don't have to start that movie at the beginning. I mean, it's good to know the whole story, but when yeah. you rewatch it, you already know the story. Yeah. Once you've seen it, you can start anywhere. Yeah, I'm trying to think. What other, what other movies can you do that with? I mean, personally, I mean, I, there are a lot of movies I could think of where I, I can do it with The Godfather too. I mean, I could always watch The Godfather. Godfather. Yeah. That's probably my dad's big rewatchable movie. He'll watch The Godfather at any moment in time. And you just know that yeah. when on The Godfather and you see Michael going into the bathroom at the Italian restaurant, you're like, oh, I'm sticking around. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah I, mean, I would say, movies. yeah. Non-mafia movies, I would say Back to the Future. Yep, absolutely. I'm always, I'm always watching that if it's on. I know, so back to, what's great about Back to the Future is that those movies are usually on together. So oh, yeah. you watch Back to the Future and you catch the tail end and you see You're watching Back to the Future too. On. You're going to watch some yeah. of the second one. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, Back to the Future is one of my favorite movies. And other ones that I can watch anytime. Even though it's not one of my favorite movies, I can do the Days and Confused because another one of those movies that's just mm-hmm. a collection of scenes. So I can put yeah. it on and then not care if I fall asleep or... Mm-hmm. Or miss it. Got a top Gun, of course. Top Gun, yeah. Well, so there was, I think the key to any kind of rewatchable movie isn't just that you can put it on, but one that if you put on, you're going to stick with it for more than just mm-hmm. a commercial break. Yeah. Almost every, uh, most 80 Schwarzenegger action movies I could do that with. I could do it with Running Man. I could do it with Total Recall. I can do it with Predator, okay. Commando. Most of those I can sit and watch 
at least 20 minutes of. Yeah, I think he was Die Hard. Oh, Die Hard, yeah. yeah. Die Hards. Oh, I, I know, I'd say probably, probably for me, it's probably the biggest – I agree that I'm, I'm an attorney, so a few good men. Oh, and my cousin yeah. Vinny. Oh, yeah. I can't think of how many times, especially with you know, Crystal likes my cousin Vinny. In fact, we actually both have a copy of it. Our DVD rack here has two my cousin Vinny's. So if anyone wants an extra, you can have one of ours. But that, that, that's the one where you can put it on and it's up. Oh, the cross examination scene's coming up for. Oh. Um, so we, good. We, we could do an episode on my cousin Vinny. I mean, easily. That's what. Easily. One of my favorite movies of all time. Another great Joe Pesci vehicle. Oh, um, yeah. Oh, Home Alone? I mean, that, that's... Yeah. yeah. I watched, I mean, now it's, that is one of the movies that I'm so glad I've been able to get my children into because I will watch that 14 times over the December month during, you know, during Christmas time. Like, I love those movies. And with Home Alone, so here's what I remember about Home Alone. Home Alone came out in either 89 or 90. Maybe officially, maybe it was filmed I think in it was 90. Yeah, so that's 30 years old. Because I think it was just the 30th anniversary, yeah. Oh, probably. My dad and I saw that in the theater. We saw that at, mm-hmm. if I'm not mistaken, the Forest Theater in, in West Haven. Back oh, yeah. The existed. old Forest Theater. So, again, we, the movie wasn't new when, it, when we saw it there. Forest was where you'd pay a dollar to see a second-run movie, but Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we have to dedicate another episode to Home Alone, but I'd say probably one of the funniest scenes, one comedy scene that I continue to laugh at 30 years later is the scene when he plays the gangster movie tape. Oh, yeah. For the pizza guy. Yeah. It's so good. Oh, yeah. Home Alone, another Joe Pesci movie. So we. My Cousin Vinny and Home Alone, two Joe Pesci movies in addition to the casino. So yeah, yeah, You really, I mean, just a phenomenal career, Joe Pesci. I think so. Even, when he's, even some of his lesser movies, like Eight Heads in a Duffel Bag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Still very good. Um, you know, yeah, Comedy Central would play that from time to time. Yeah. <laughs> it's watchable. Yeah, I mean, I think about the other Joe Pesci movies I've seen, but enough of them. I mean, obviously, The Irishman is worthy of its own episode. Mm-hmm. It's great in that. I, I think Russ, Joe Pesci as Russ Buffalino was yeah. possibly his best. Great character. Time. So in terms of real-life casino experiences, what's your game? Um, I'm, I love craps. Uh, craps is the great is a game that you can just sit and play for hours and hours and not win a whole lot of money, but also not lose a whole lot of money and just have a lot of fun doing it. Yeah, that, that's one of my favorites. That's one of the few games I've actually learned how to play. Now, I don't say I have a system. I mean, I, I think everybody, anyone who's ever gone to the casino says he or she has a system. And there's no such thing as a system. Yeah. But very least with craps, it's a game where you can, you don't have to bet a whole lot. And you, you can really ride out a run. Hey, you know, maybe you get yeah. lucky and you, you hit a few rolls. Other times, you, know, again, you might not win a lot, but you might not really lose a lot either. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a time hey, – so, um, I went to the casino. So I'm in a – I'm in a um, – the State Bar Association. We had a, a training retreat at Foxwoods last summer. Nice. Right. I'm, uh, I'm, on, the, I'm the criminal law co-chair of the young lawyer section. So I'm still considered a young lawyer somehow, but it just shows that our profession has a lot of old people in it. <laughs> the, 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 the training was at, the retreat was at Foxwoods. And over the course of the day, we were doing various trainings and icebreakers and things like that. Mm-hmm. And one of the things was a scavenger hunt because I mean, this is like college orientation, but for people oh. who were attorneys. And I'm at the casino I'm saying, and I'm just telling people in my group, like, hey, uh, this is the longest I've ever been in a casino without actually gambling. I, I think I'm feeling withdrawal right now. Yeah. It's like that scene in Vegas Vacation where he leaves the breakfast table and puts $100 down, loses it, and comes right back. <laughs> yeah. No, actually, I, I did pretty well that night. Um, 
uh, I'd say overall with my life in casinos, I probably, I, maybe I've come out a little ahead. Maybe I've broken even, but I never really lost a whole lot either. I'll tell you wow. one time years ago, we were at Mohegan and we were playing one of those junk games that Texas. Oh, it was, yeah, it was Texas Hold'em against the house or yeah. Ultimate yeah. Texas Hold'em or something like that. I remember I was losing money. Like, I'll play one more round. We'll see. And I got the pocket aces or something. And I won some like 200 yeah. bucks on a $5 bet. Like, All right. That's a good day. That was, was one of the random days, like 11 o'clock on a Tuesday in the summer when my mom randomly wanted to go to the casino. And we all went. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. It was like, yeah, I'm not doing anything. Let's go. Yeah. Uh, I tell you, the first time I ever went into a casino, I was – Going into my senior year of high school, my mom and I went to Providence to look at Brown University. Mm. And, you know, Brown is a good school. I didn't think the tour was that good. I really wasn't that impressed. We actually walked off the tour. It was kind of like, you really want to go here? And I said, nah. Not really. So as we were driving back, my, my mom's a statistician, so she likes numbers. and mm. So I decided to stop at Foxwoods. And we went into Foxwoods thinking, oh, this is going to be great. We're going to see all sorts of colorful stuff. No, we saw lots of old people. Oh, yeah. Lots of old people. Um, yeah, we didn't play. We played, we played, I think, a couple of quarters and slot machines and didn't win. That was it. So that was my first time in a casino. And then, yeah, when I became of age, we started going to more. Um, probably the best casino story I have isn't even mine. Um, my dad's family, my dad's side of the family is Italian. A lot, a lot of gamblers in that family. Mm-hmm. One of my great aunts was, uh, had a, um, I guess it wasn't a seizure, but she didn't want to get up from her slot machine to take insulin because yeah, you, don't want to <laughs> slot, you don't want to get up from a slot machine and then have it hit, right? Yeah. So, yeah, my, my, uh, one of my great aunts collapsed at a slot machine. Nice. Take her insulin because she was there. So she actually, so after that happened, she had a new system in place. What do you think my, uh, what do you think my great aunt did to avoid that happening? She had someone else administer her insulin? See, that, that would be a good or, idea. Or, no, or got it. Or. No, even better. She just decided that she wasn't going to eat when she went to the casino. So her oh. blood sugar wouldn't spike. Hey, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah, exactly. You, know, you, you, you have to ride the hot machine. So anyway, yeah. that's, uh, that's how Foxwood stays in, in business. I remember when my, my grandmother got sick before she had a chance to go to the casino. And, and it probably, probably saved, <laughs> saved her quite a bit of money. But I remember at her wake, this was in, you know, in 2000, one of my dad's long friends walked in and Said, hey Tom, this is like an episode of The Sopranos. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then my dad saying, Foxwoods is losing a lot of money tonight because everybody's here in North Haven. So. Yeah, I mean, the number of social security checks that go directly to Foxwoods is very high. Yeah. It's, oh. it's sad. Yeah. Um, I mean, years ago, my dad and I were driving. We go to New London for some reason. I think I had a mock trial term, something like that. Mm. I was in high school. And we were just, we were on 95, probably an old Saybrook. And we passed a car of two old ladies driving a woodside station wagon. Oh, we, know those, we know where they're going. Oh, just yeah. as when you and I were behind Louie driving the Cadillac on the George Washington Bridge, we knew where he was going. <laughs> we knew where he was going. He was going to Brantford to drop his wife off. Then he was going to Foxwoods. Then he was, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, man. So with Casino, I mean, this movie had so many different storylines, so many different characters. Would you be able to spin it off or break it down into either a TV series or just another movie i think this like i would love to see honestly we talked about it the real story is more fascinating than the movie i want to see a ken burns seven episode documentary on this that's what i want to see yeah like i mean 
like it, it would be the perfect long form documentary. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I mean, you could make that's that's true. Ken Burns, if you're listening, you've done the Civil War, you did Prohibition, so there's some mob and baseball. Why not a full mob documentary? Yeah, 12 episodes, whatever. You know, do New York, do Chicago, do Miami. I mean, yeah, Vegas. That, that someone has to do that. If I were spinning the movie off, I would probably focus it on just the skim and get more into the mechanics. Yeah. And, and the, the thing is, the whole thing with exchanging the cash and the coins, and then you have the change girls could be characters. I would probably cast Blake Lively as one of my change girls. Yeah. Possibly Sophia Bush, right? Sophia Bush yeah. has the good casino raspy voice. She can pull that character off. Yeah. And you could focus it in on, instead of it being, you know, maybe the casino is the starting point, but the movie focuses more on the guys in Milwaukee and Cleveland and, mm-hmm. how and what's going on there while the casino is making money. The thing is, yeah. I, don't know who, I don't know who, and De Niro and Pesci are definitely, I mean, they're, they're the best. You know, they have the gangster mm-hmm. archetype. I honestly don't know like what what younger Italian American actors, or even if they're not Italian, who are the younger gangster actors? I mean, again, there hasn't been a good. Mo- the thing is, The Irishman was the last great mob movie, and that's the old guys. Yeah. yeah, it's it's really like the last, like the people that were on The Sopranos, like Michael Imperioli is probably yeah, the young the, guy who's now the old guy, like. I mean, he's been around for a long time. Like, I mean, he was Spider in, right. uh, in Goodfellas. Goodfellas. Yeah. That's right, Michael Imperioli. Um, even The Sopranos, I mean, there weren't that many young characters no. in it. So, right, I don't, I don't know who I... I mean, Ray Liotta is, is older as well. He's not as old yeah. as Pesci and De Niro, but, I mean, again, he made Goodfellas in 1990 or 91. He was already yeah. in his 30s. Yeah, again, I can't think of many. Um, yeah, I guess you'd bring more. Yeah, probably somebody off one of the crime TV shows, maybe. Possibly yeah. Play a, one of the male leads in the mob. There needs to be a new renaissance of mob, mob I movies. I think so. I, mean, I think, we're, think we're, we're off to a good start with, with our movie. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can do so much. I mean, the... I think it's just hard to make a good mob movie. And the fact that only a few directors have done it. And Scorsese, Coppola, you know, Brian De Palma did Scarface. So you, you have some. Um, and Chaz Palminteri's directed a couple. But yeah, they're just, um, I, I think it might just be that as the real mob has, has fallen, the movies have too. Yeah. This isn't a whole lot. Um, maybe, maybe there is stuff going on with the original mafia, but you know, so many of them, you know, they're broken up. They, they went to prison. Oh, you know what would be a good one? I, mean, I forgot the guy's name, but we both listened to that episode of Corolla's podcast about the, the gas scam that they were running. Oh, yeah. That was yeah. great. I forgot a family. That's the Colombo family or the Bonanno family. It was one of the New York family, Lucchese, one of them. They're, they're, yeah, they're, that was also a skim-type situation. That would be a good movie. Let's see here. Yeah, I remember that. Well, I can't remember which family that was. Oh, that was really good. That was the, where they would, they would they, it was a tax scheme. Oh, yeah. it was, uh, the, the business was Rossi Associates. That's it. It was, oh, it was all of them. I mean, it was the Colombo, Gambino, Lucchese, and Genovese oh. were, all, um, were all involved. Yeah. They collected one, one and a half percent from each gallon. Yeah, imagine that. I mean, basically, imagine a cent per gallon of gas sold in the United States. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, I, I like those white collar schemes because they're interesting, not because I condone them. They're, they're very interesting. But right, I mean, yeah, I just can't think of, um, I guess I don't watch enough crime TV shows to know who the, the young criminal actors are. Mm-hmm. 
But yeah, no, I like the Sierra yeah. Sons. I mean, it, Johnny Depp did some gangster movies. I'm just a little tired of Johnny Depp. Yeah. He's too much of a self parody. That's the thing. I, did, you ever, did you see Black Mass, the movie about White no. Vulture? Not no. a bad movie. Like, the thing is, I'll watch a gangster movie and I'll always like it for, by it being a gangster movie. Yeah. But you, know, you have a Whitey Bulger. Like there's, they could have done such a better job with that, that whole story. Yeah. I mean, The Departed, which is loosely based yeah, on I mean, Whitey Bulger, was way better. Yeah, that's a phenomenal mob movie. Yeah, that's it's, the thing. So I mean, it, back to Casino in that Casino is a great movie, one that we love. But I'll admit, it's not Scorsese's best movie. I, I think Goodfellas no. and The Departed are actually better movies. I agree. You know, it's just for us more, more likable, more uh, to, to some extent relatable, yeah. more rewatchable. Not to say I wouldn't watch Goodfellas if it comes on, because of course I would. Yeah, I'll watch the helicopter scene of, of Goodfellas all the time. Yeah, so that's another one. I I do not know what it's like to be chased by the FBI and coked up or any of that. But on days when I have a lot of things to do, I think of that scene. Oh yeah, you're racing around, you have a helicopter on you. You're you're worried about about making your sauce that night. I mean, tell them not to let the sauce stick. Yeah, well, right. You don't want your sauce to burn. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a great great movie, great scene. So, so many other things we can do. But yeah, that's Casino. Um, yeah, other movies we can talk about or comprehensive we can talk about. Plenty of options there. Oh yeah, more to come. Yeah, so this will conclude the casino episode. So we might have a lot of problems and sometimes those get buried in the desert. But for us, uh, the eye in the sky is watching us all. We hope that some of you are watching this video, listening to this podcast. This was an episode of The Law Talking Guy featuring Steve. Dr. Steve. Law Talking Guy is a production of Law 203. You can go to our website, law203.com, and listen for more episodes. Um, again, Steve and I are having a good time doing this. We'll probably do quite a few more. So thanks again, Steve. Absolutely. And, thanks for having me. And then until uh, next time, talk to you soon. Take it easy.